Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're all well. Uh, Tools of the Trade panel, um, over the next hour or so, we're going to discuss uh, the various techniques, strategies, technology platforms that artists, labels, brands utilize across all aspects of their career, from uh, marketing, promotion, social media, and so on, just to try and provide some insights into how to potentially make the most of them. Um, so regardless of sort of what stage you're, you're at in your career, uh, hopefully you'll get something um, to take away from this. Um, I'm going to introduce you uh, to my, let my panel make the introductions themselves. Go ahead. Cool. Hi, um, my name's Myrad. That's how you pronounce it. Um, I am a freelance independent um, marketing and digital manager. Um, so I work mainly specifically with artists um, on their marketing strategy and their social media. Um, so I've worked with various artists in the past, but at the moment I'm working with Eats Everything, um, Sasha Blondish and Patrice Formel uh, to run all of their marketing and social media. Um, previous to this, I, was, um, I did a similar role at Alt Management and worked with a whole host of other DJs. But yeah, that's kind of it. Hey, good everyone. My name's Luke Curtis. So I'm a freelance photographer and I specialize exclusively in the dance music industry. Um, I work with the likes of DJ Mag, Time Out, Mix Mag, um, and sort of some of the larger promoters. I've worked with Elro previously. So I either shoot live events or work with artists directly in terms of building their EPKs or press shots that they'll subsequently use to market themselves as an artist in the music industry. I've got one. Hey. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm Seb Simone. I'm head of digital for Warner Brothers Records in the UK. Um, our team look after social media, content creation, digital strategy and streaming platforms for um, a real range of artists from the likes of Dua Lipa, Royal Blood, Muse, um, James Hype, Michael Calfan, Lil Pump, uh, just to name a few. Thanks. Hey guys, my name's Inda. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Crypt. So Crypt is basically a creative agency. We work with brands to basically help them access and enter the music industry. So we work with a lot of the sort of top um, global brands that you can imagine. And we also work with IMS, which is one of our clients. And yeah, our big emphasis is on basically how can brands support the music industry through partnerships and sort of strategic collaborations. And I am Paul Hamill. I'm the uh, co-founder of InFlight. And we're a delivery platform uh, for record labels to distribute uh, pre-release promos to DJs and tastemakers. We provide software to uh, many of the world's sort of uh, largest dance labels, brands, and PR companies. So here we are. Uh, we're going to start off, I guess, uh, dipping into the, the world of technology. Um, it's called Tools of the Trade, but a, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today you know, they're, they're really techniques or they're, they're, they're things that people can, can, can adopt, practice themselves to, uh, to sort of enhance their careers and kind of uh, build profiles sort of through social media and so on. But um, firstly, we just want to discuss the impact that technology has had over the last couple of years in terms of the barriers to entry for new and emerging artists. How, how do you think that it, it has impacted on it? I mean... From my perspective, I guess it's, it's added a whole other layer to the skills that you need to have as an artist these days. You know, it, it, you also now, as well as being a DJ or a producer, you need to be a photographer, you need to be a social media manager, you need to be a million and one things, um, which is obviously difficult because not everyone has all of those, those key strengths. Um, so it, it can make for some challenges, but at the same time, Social media is the great equaliser. It's given everyone a voice um, and everyone a chance to cut through. So from my point of view, I guess it's really about constructing a strategy that works for you to help you stand out from all of that noise and make use of those tools, which hopefully we can talk about today to be helpful. Yeah, definitely to echo that. I kind of think that multi-touch point approach is, is like not just a kind of... Uh, something that would be nice to have, it's a need to have in this kind of age of music. It's, it's not just a case of having great music, you need to be able to you know, market yourself, you need to be able to you know, uh, sort of fill the gaps in all of the different areas of consumption, whether that be streaming or sort of in the live arena, there's just so many more different touch points and facets to building a kind of cohesive 360 music brand that that's kind of the game at the minute, I suppose. 
Yeah, so my thoughts on sort of the technology and the emergence of technology, <clears throat> like both of you guys have suggested, it does mean as an artist you have to master so many different elements to, to sort of try and to position yourself in the market. I'm a big, uh, you know, I'm really into my technology. I think the integration of it and doing it correctly um, is the way forward for a lot of artists to really propel themselves. You know, there's some really good examples of artists utilizing technology to, to push their self forward and even non-artists. So, you know, an example, Bradley Gunn Raver is a guy that isn't an artist, but he's successfully utilized, you know, technology to really push his brand in the industry. So um, I think it adds a lot of value if done right. Obviously it's a double-edged sword if it isn't done right you can find yourself massively engrossed in it, losing time and not being effective. So that's kind of my stance on it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, technology obviously has made it easier for artists to get their voice out there. There's some other sides of it which are really interesting, um, which we, we can talk about sort of personally, but like how you can use things like Facebook ads to, you know, sell your product. You know, it's quite a specific aspect of social media and technology that, you know, we're, you're, you're seeing, when I, I think when we're talking about technology here, a large part of it is like digital platforms, essentially. So you'll see like a whole realm of um, analytics platforms, sort of at social buying platforms that basically allow you to sort of reach your audience in a really interesting way. Uh, I think for, how many people here want to become sort of DJs and artists? Right, but I, so I'd say, okay, the vast majority. So it seems like, one of the aspects of technology which is really important is how its creativity has become sort of um, democratized in a sense. Anyone can create some content and get it out there. So things that I think are really worth looking at is like live streaming. Like how many DJs here have put out a live stream of them having a mix? Small proportion. So this is all like, yeah, it's all you know very accessible stuff and I think when the, the thing that I really like to look at initially is what's the most accessible first things that you could start working on in technology. So things like live streaming, then getting into social ad buying, you know, thinking about your Facebook strategy. And then there's a whole other world of things that you can then start touching on later, which is the, the new platforms and so on. Do you think, given all the technology that, and the tools that people have access to, um, there's a, a bit of a misconception maybe among younger talent that the technology does all the work for you um, to the extent that we're missing the human connection on which relationships and careers are built. Would you see that as a problem? I actually, I think that technology gives us, specifically social media, gives us an opportunity to create that human connection. Um, I mean, if you think about the amount of artists that you follow on social media, how before social media, you would never know as much as you do about them. Um, you really get, you can delve into someone's personality and really understand them as a person and as an artist. So in a way, it gives you more of an opportunity to make a connection with your audience because you've got all these platforms to use. It's true. I saw an interview like the other day, um, I saw Skepta. He was on Instagram. And on Instagram, you've got this feature now where you can bring someone into your live feed with you. So he was on Instagram talking to his audience, and then he every five minutes he'd have another fan in the stream with him, and he'd basically just be having a conversation with them. He did it for about two hours, and I stayed logged into that for at least 40 minutes or so, just because I thought it was such an interesting way for him to connect with his fan base. It was you know, really nice to see, because this is someone who's considered a global superstar, but technology has allowed him to get closer to his fan base and actually have that personal relationship, which is really nice. I definitely, I, I don't think there is a misconception actually, or at least there probably shouldn't be. I, I think you, you you can have access to all the kind of platforms and opportunity in the world, but you still have to bring it in whatever shape and form that might mean. Um, so that's a great example. And I think ultimately if you if you have that kind of connection with people, you, you know, you'll, you'll progress and it will kind of materialize. So that's really the crux of, of you know building your brand from the start up. Yeah. Um, at what point in the last couple of years did DJs and artists suddenly turn into brands? When did that happen? You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, the first time I, I heard reference of DJs being a brand was a, a promoter in Lithuania or somewhere was, was discussing with me about doing a gig and he said, you need a, you need a brand if you want to play here. I'm like, a brand? What, like a logo? You know, wh when did this happen? I, a, a brand is just like, it's just language like everyone's always had a brand it's just the way it's been packaged up and sort of presented is sort of maybe changed over time um i think you know however far back you want to look brands have always existed it's just the shape that they've taken has 
has kind of evolved over the, particularly the last two, five, ten years? I think in terms of talking about artists as a brand, I think a real turning point for the music industry, for me personally, would be Daft Punk. I think they really, you know, set a, you know, set a precedent in terms of creating uh, an, an alter ego that they could work off. And if you reference that to other industries, you know, Marshall Mathers, Eminem, Slim Shady, you know, almost creating this alter ego, like a superhero, that they can then, they can then push themselves through creating this really... Um, refined narrative about their story, you know, which subsequently builds the brand to the superstars they are today. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you think, look, look like even like the Gorillas, for example, like that brand world that they've built. And I think it's true. You could probably, if you wanted to, I, I suggest this as a tip, right? Maybe look at the your top fa five favorite artists and just start trying to analyze what is their brand. You know, so you can think about the language that they use to create their presence. You know, I might say, okay, let's just take gorillas and start thinking about like, well, how, what have they created here and what could I learn from that to give my own sort of interesting way of interpreting it. In like, typically what you'd imagine is that there are a lot of people around you who can help with this as well. People who might have studied branding and marketing, but anyone can access this kind of knowledge. It's like, it's actually really simple stuff to sort of really look at the artist and think like, what colors do they use? How do they express themselves? What language do they have? What's the world that they've created? And then you want to, Think about how, how does that apply to your own creative vision? You know, what can you bring to this world as an artist that's different? Because I think you'll find a lot of the time is that many artists, it just, it just gets kind of like this blur of loads of artists that are pretty much all the same, generic, don't have any individual vision or message. And I think this is like the, you're, at any point of your career, you should be thinking about that. Like what is your unique angle and your, your message that you're trying to bring to life? And it, I think... Further to that point, I think you kind of a great place to start with that is to have a look at you as an individual artist and think, okay, what are my strengths as a person and as an artist? So not everyone's going to be the sexy guy or the sexy girl who's going to be taking beautiful shots of themselves. Maybe they're maybe you're really funny. Maybe <clears throat> maybe it's not about that for you. It's all about the, the music and it's all about the studio and you're really really amazing in the studio. Then can you build your brand around that, about being a studio head and sharing production tips, that kind of stuff. Like it, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be something that's really constructed. It can be, it should be playing on your own genuine strengths. That's how you create, you know, a really genuine brand. Is is pull on the areas that you know you're good at. There's literally no one right answer to that either. I think, like, you know, I always challenge our artists to ask themselves why should people care what I have to say? And if it's difficult to answer that, then you kind of need to go back and have a think about it. And it's really just trying to craft a narrative and a story that is interesting to people. And like you were saying, there's literally no kind of one uh, sort of solution or, or, or route to go down that's, a, that's the right thing to do. It's different for every single person in every different kind of area. So it's just something I think that's always good to kind of ask yourself when you're, you're creating that kind of brand and that, that sort of proposition. Do you think it's something that um, possibly the less you think about it, the better, and it will emerge over time if you just yeah, let it happen? It should totally be natural. Like you said, it's so thinking about what, what are your strengths, what do people like about what you have to say, and then that should craft the direction of, of how you present yourself across, you know, particularly social media, but, but more broadly as well. Uh, is it possible, though, to, to maintain that authenticity with a brand without having to resort to, you know, mouse heads and gimmicks and, uh, and that kind of thing. What do you I, think, Luke? Yeah, I think so. I think um, a way to do that at all to really utilise is, you know, your, your EPK or working with a PR company to create your brand guidelines. If you look at any massive multinational organisation, Coca-Cola, for instance, you walk into any store and their message is exactly the same. And that's what you need to be replicating in your copy or your brand message. You know, understand your narrative, refine it, really sort of be able to refer to it at any point in time and know it like the back of your hand and continue telling it consistently. And, and there you have a brand in itself and, and it will only continue to grow because naturally people will buy into that. Um, so that's if you're commissioned for a job, say, with, with, with a leading artist and you're, you're looking at sort of thinking of ideas for a concept to shoot them, how do you translate what you see in their brand into what you turn into an image that will reflect their 
position? It's a, an interesting question. So before I would spend time shooting an artist, if they want to work on images that will go towards their uh, press kit, I will look at all of their social media channels and, and get an idea of, you know, what genre they specifically sit in, what gigs they are trying to get, you know, what, what part of the music industry are they trying to break into? Is it house? Is it disco? Is it tech house? Um, and then from that, start working on a creative brief. You know, if it's techno, of course, it's going to be a bit darker and a bit more edgy. If it's disco, it's going to be more colorful. Um, and then those images will align with their brand. You know, there's no point shooting uh, a glitter box disco DJ in the same way you'd shoot, you know, Sven Vaff or something like that. You, you know, you have to make it, you know, fall in line with their, you know, their, their long-term strategy. So that's how I would go about doing it. And, and uh, yeah, sort of almost give them advice in terms of how they should be using it. And in terms of um, putting together a campaign, uh, Murad, for somebody like, like Eats Everything or, or Sasha, when you're pulling all these components together, like the image, the, the message, the social media, can you give us some insight into the sort of the planning, the type of assets that you, 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 you pull together for a campaign? Um, I guess the, the, the easiest thing to look at would be a single release, like a download release. Um, usually with independent record labels, you get quite a small amount of assets. You get usually just a cover, a cover pick, um, which is sometimes generic to the label um, and occasionally like an animation. So, you know, that in itself is probably not going to be enough for you. Um, so usually what, how I would do it is to look at, obviously, the, the tune comes first. What does it represent? How, you know, how does it make you feel? Um, you know, is it, you know, what emotions does it, does it bring up? Um, also, the title is always a really great thing to play on. Very handy when you've got artists who come up with really wacky titles for their tracks. Um, and then I would go about looking at create, creating content around that. Um, a lot of what I do with my artists is very much, um, we don't really commission much content. We create it in-house, I do it, they contribute to it. Um, so it's quite DIY. Um, but video, I mean, video for me is the real, is the, bit, the thing that makes such a big difference. Um, so it could be coming up with something, say, for Eats Everything, like we had a release out the other day. Um, and I don't know if you all saw Theresa May doing her dancing. Um, and his release was out that week. Um, so we came up with, like, an edit of Theresa dancing to the track. So, and, you know, a simple idea, but it, the engagement was amazing on it. And it definitely helped to to push that release along. Um, so it could be something funny like that. Or, and the other big thing is DJs playing your track. Like those videos are, I mean, you see them all over your, the, your feed, they're everywhere, but they work. They really do work because you're then putting your track into a, a context of an artist, another artist playing it, seeing, you know, people who are going to buy your music can see that it's working in the clubs. You know, you're just giving them a reason to, to download it. Um, so yeah, those are a few of the things that I'd look at. And how, how would that compare to something that happens at Warner, for example? I mean, I, I, I imagine there's a lot more bodies around the table, uh, planning and a lot of a lot more strategy goes in to. It's the same process though. Yeah. Like you're, you're looking at what assets you have, which which perhaps are, are more from a kind of major label track release um, in a lot of instances, but it always hinges around video content, really. Um, in terms of the assets you have and then how they're used across different social media platforms. Um, and that word context you mentioned before, I think it's quite an interesting uh, sort of area as well. It's like popular, popular kind of topical context is really interesting in terms of being able to hinge a track around something. So uh, another example that just came to mind when, when you were talking about that Theresa May thing, when Love Island was on, um, which, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like a, a TV show where people go and sort of get voted out, and it's just really topical. It's talked about all the time, and it trends on Twitter every time it's, it's on TV. Um, and we were releasing this tune uh, called Don't Rip My Holiday, and that's the, the sort of hook of the tune. So just, like, getting some clips from that show where people are getting essentially burned for, like, really just awkward, tense moments, and then overlaying that and then pushing that out, and you're kind of reaching a different audience at the same time. They're, like, interesting ways of just tapping into what is popular in kind of, uh, you know, culture at that given time. But back, back to the point, yeah, I think the processes are, are the same. It's around what assets you have. There's a rollout to, to make sure an audience knows that it's coming, and then it's promoting it in whatever way, shape, and form, whether it's digital advertising, kind of above-the-line radio 
uh, promotion, streaming strategy, all that sort of thing. What about you under you know, your company, um, some of the type of campaigns that you guys have worked on? Can you give us some insight into you know, maybe, maybe one of your most successful campaigns that you have done? Yeah, one that's quite recent. Um, we're working with ASICS at the moment, and we've done a partnership with Novelist, who's basically a grime artist from London. He recently just got nominated for a Mercury Prize. You know, he released an album this year. It was really, really interesting. And for that, we've done this partnership where he's basically like a headline ambassador for the brand. He's created music for the brand. So what we did in this context is, so just to give you some idea, I basically run a marketing agency that does partnerships with brands and artists. And our, one of our key messages is create art, not ads. Because if you look at the advertising industry, most people just ignore advertising. So when you're working with artists, what we like to do is give them the creative control. So with this project specifically, we gave Novelist a budget to basically create a song for the campaign. And that was the concept there. So it was completely, you know, he runs his own label, so it was slightly easier to get that deal ahead. Um, but essentially, yeah, so ASICS had a new shoe coming out, and then we gave Novelist uh, the chance to basically create a song to announce this new shoe. There wasn't mention of ASICS in the track, so it was, it's like it felt really authentic, but ASICS got to release it, and it's their asset, essentially. So we really like to work on ways like that with artists where we can sort of give them creative control and let them sort of take the, the next steps. And then, obviously, when it comes to brand partnerships as well, you can do some really cool stuff around promoting the artist's music. So um, if they've got an EP coming out or an album coming out, we'll try and fit the brand partnership around their schedule so that it helps boost their promotion as well. But that's, that's one that we've just done quite recently. Um, we did another one with Packer Raban with Jax Jones, who's a sort of big, bigger sort of, um, I guess you could say, pop star type DJ. And that was, we literally just took 50 of the best dancers in London and we got Jax Jones to do an unannounced gig in the middle of South Bank and Covent Garden. And so that, you know, he announced it on the same day on Twitter and Instagram to his fan base. And then hundreds of people just turned up and we had a party in the middle of the street. So we, 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 you know, we'd like to try and just experiment. But a big vision for us is like giving the artist control and not letting the brand dictate what the artist should do. I think touching on the, the word brand partnerships and, and you mentioned earlier about getting DJs to play your music. I think brand partnership can seem like a, a really scary word to some people at, at grassroots, you know. A, a very simple way is if you are a producer, is, you know, get that music out to as many DJs as possible that are gonna play it. Effectively, that's a brand partnership. You, you've created affiliate marketing, in a sense. Um, they're gonna continue to push your brand and they're gonna have their own audience that you can tap into effectively. If you get 10 DJs, each with 10 followers, you know, it's very simple to do the maths. And that's a very simple brand partnership that you can utilize at, at grassroots to, to develop yourself and sort of get to that next stage in, in your career. Chris? Okay, um, just uh, yeah, continuing on with sort of uh, social media stuff. Um, is, there, is there such a thing as overexposure in social media? You know, some artists are out there, they're in your face, you follow them on Twitter and it's everything, they retweet every single mention of themselves. Other artists are a lot more refined. You work, with, we've spoken about some of the artists you work with, Patrice Bramel, for example. Um, what, 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 at what point does, does it become too much and where, 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 where should people draw the line or how do they find what's right for them, for their audience? Um, I think uh, a, good, a good way to kind of to look at this is you should only speak when you have something interesting to say. Um, so, I mean, there are all sorts of rules, like, in terms of how often you should post on different social media platforms, but overkilling it with promotional, in-your-face, like, selling um, on your social media is just, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, and it, it, the, the way that I think that you need to look at it is, do you have something authentic to say? And are you finding interesting, real ways to say things to your audience? Um, so someone like Patrice, I mean, he specifically doesn't want to, I mean, there's one or two shows that he'll post a flyer for, like on his Instagram stories, but in general, he doesn't really do pre-promotion unless he's really, really excited about a gig. Um, and then he'll, you know, we'll post a photo from, maybe he played there last year. Um, but his, his attitude towards it is very much about, um, he doesn't want, he wants his fans to trust him. He wants to have an authentic relationship with them. And no one wants to be sold to. 
Um, so I guess, obviously, to promote yourself, you've got to do a certain amount of selling. Um, I guess it's about finding ways to to not overtly sell to your audience, to build that relationship. Like, there's a, you know, there's some theory that you should be giving your audience kind of 90% of the time you're giving to your audience. So you're, um, you know, giving them interesting uh, content, photos, videos, you know, stuff that isn't selling. And then 5% of the time you should be selling to them. So you need to build up that level of trust um, in order to be able to actually get them to engage and go and buy something that you're trying to sell. Yeah, I mean, I would say you don't follow, or most people probably don't follow an artist on Instagram because of their music. You follow an artist on Instagram because you like the content that they're putting on Instagram. So that's probably just a really measured way of thinking about how that space works. It's definitely... People like music, but people also like people. So you've got to kind of sell yourself, or not sell yourself, but be be likable in that sense for enough for people to want to follow and engage with what you're doing versus just promoting yourself constantly. It's the balance. Do you think is it possible, Inder, for, for artists to exist or break through these days without having a, a large social media presence? Uh, generally, probably not, I'm there assuming. Are a couple. There are a couple, yeah, there are a couple who don't really, I mean, like, you look at Dixon, for example, who's considered the number one DJ in the world. He's quite active on Instagram. But, but he does, it's very constructed, though. Right. Even though, like, even though he, he drops it at certain, you yeah. know, he, he, he hold back quite a lot. Um, it's def there's definitely a strategy behind that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. Like, they're, they're, you know what, what's interesting? When The Weeknd came out, and I'm going to take us to, like, outside of the dance music world, but when The Weeknd came out, there was a whole like mystery around who is this person. And you know, we live in a world now where it's so easy just to like Google someone and know everything about them so instantly. So I do think that depending on the type of music you make and the narrative that you're trying to create, I can see how creating some sense of mystery around your art can be really good. Um, the, a good example is Zoo. Um, he was Z-H-U, I think, you know, he, you might have heard of some of his stuff. Um, that was completely like mystery marketing in a sense, right? Like no one knew who the hell it was. It was just a logo, which clearly was a very nicely designed logo, but it was just so much intrigue and they kept that going to the point where like it, it creates more interest. And I do, I can see that happening in some ways. Yeah, you, you, know, you don't need to have a social media marketing, but generally, like, generally having a following that is like truly engaged in your message makes sense. But Maybe not at the detriment of building your, your sort of your actual music. And in electronic music specifically, relationships are so important. It's such a small little scene. Like there's only so many like promoters and record labels and clubs. And it depends on which direction you want to go. Like, do you want your music synced? And do you want to do big deals with FIFA and create a clothing line? Like Peggy Goo's just done a deal where she's going to be launching her own clothing line. She needs a social media following to do that stuff. But if you just want to sort of you know. DJ at clubs and have this great relationship with a, with a, with an audience. You don't probably don't need like a massive following to do that. You just need good relationships. I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear your point because this isn't necessarily my space. <laughs> I, I think I, I don't know if I completely disagree, but I think in this day and age, um, I, we were talking about this before. Um, promoters look at your social media following, um, and it's whether we like it or not. It's a, it's the truth. Um, and you know you need to be, be able to bring a crowd to a club, and a really easy way for them to identify whether people are interested in you is by looking at the size of your social media following. So I kind of think, yeah, you probably still need one. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and to sort of follow on from that, one of the first things that radio producers and DJs do, you know, kind of in the in the UK at least irrespective of what the music sounds like, is go straight to an Instagram profile and look at it. That will give you a sort of, uh, that palette will give you a snapshot of who an artist is and what their sort of numbers are so quickly that I think you can't dismiss it. Yeah, we can't ignore it anymore. That's just the way it is, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's the, the whole thing has changed from being, you know, a scene where people were booked on their talent and their ability to uh, rock a dance floor. Now it is, it's numbers first and, you know, <laughs> There's, there's, there's two sides to that. You know, it is a business, and the numbers 
tend to drive the market and, and they are good indicators. But do you not think that, you know, we're, 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 there, there are artists, true artists out there who are maybe getting left behind because they might have the best talent, they might be making the best tunes, but they just don't have the numbers or they're not interested in, in doing that side of things? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, but from somebody that works in the industry, um, I would definitely say some people that, you know, if, if they don't have a, you know, a real understanding or can work with somebody with an understanding of social media, it can be difficult for them and they can be left behind. And I think, you know, on the subject, tools of the trade, technology will drive any industry. Um, if you look, once upon a time, we only had radio and that was very much based on your sound as an artist. Then TV came along and that was very much about TV adverts. Then the internet came along and it was about snapshots of people's lives. As technology drives things forward, artists have to adapt to that and social media is, is, is a crucial tool to do it. Um, so yes, in answer to your question, if you, if you can't jump on the back of it, there is potential you could be lost. I think the, the key here is actually, of course, you need to build a social media audience. You can't really ignore it unless you've got some amazing networking team behind you that's like pulling some deals together that you, you know, you, you basically have like that in your back pocket. But one thing that I will definitely highlight is that the most important element is actually building an engaged audience. It doesn't matter how big it is necessarily, because I've done, we've shown this to brands before, right? We did a deal one time where the artist had 150,000 followers on Instagram and was like, you know, he was growing, signed to a major label, huge talent with songs on, on, the, on the TV and all this kind of stuff. And then we did a partnership with another artist who had 15,000 followers. And obviously, funnily enough, the smaller artist had more engaged fans, a much more real, like a proper community behind it. And that's because he was really thinking about how to build that engaged audience. So I don't think the numbers matter as much. Maybe when it comes to certain things, it does, but at the end of it, it's actually like developing a strategy to engage your audience. Because as your following grows, if you're not creating content that people care about, it's all like artificial stuff. You're not actually building a real fan base of people that care about what you're talking about. So you might have 150,000 followers, but you've got 10 likes on a picture. Is that real? Yeah, the engagement rate or the engagement of, of an artist's kind of uh, ecosystem is way more valuable than the overall number, 100%. Like, everyone can see past having massive numbers and having 10 likes on photos. It's too visible. Um, that, so that's, and especially in the sort of grassroots phase, that one-to-one -one relationship you can craft with your audience is so important. Like, even the, the, the kind of minor detail of like replying to people, liking people's things, just creating that depth with them. We've done some really interesting things where you can use, which we'll perhaps talk about later, where you can use technology to understand who your most engaged followers are. And then you can, you know, have a relationship with them by giving them things before you give it, out, put it out publicly. That is a really sort of in, neat thing to do. And yeah, definitely engagement over following. And also, the, the thing to think about as well is the way that the algorithms on most social media platforms work is that good engagement helps you build your following. So if people are engaging with your content, um, the more people are going to see it. So engagement, yeah, is everything. Should people be looking outside of the, 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 the sort of big technology platforms and try to build something themselves, whether that's, you know, through email marketing and, and that kind of stuff? Or are we sort of relying too heavily on... Facebook and what they decide to, to, to show our fans? I think the, what's happened with Facebook um, in terms of how people are use, you know, not using the platform maybe as much as they used to and pages aren't getting the kind of engagement they used to kind of teaches us a lesson that we also need to rely on building our own, um, our own databases because if, you know, like we were talking about before, if um, you know Instagram are going to change the, the the algorithm this week, I think you know, yeah, um, and you know you put all of your eggs into the Instagram basket, they just change their algorithm, and then you can't get to any of your own fans. Um, so definitely creating um, databases and gathering data is is really good. So are we able to give us an insight into some of the tools that uh, Warner would use for? sort of b building fan bases and monitoring that fan base to see how they're engaging with their artists and responding to, to new releases? So I think across all of the major platforms in the social and streaming space, they all have very good analytical tools, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, Spotify for artists, Apple for artists. But outside of that, 
kind of looking at perhaps more towards free tools that you can kind of get access to that give you an insight that you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, there's a thing called Social Rank that's really cool that allows you to understand who your followers are on previously Instagram and Twitter, but the Instagram thing's gone away for a moment. And that works by essentially putting your handle into uh, this platform, it then generating who your followers are based on their engagement with you, based on their following, if you just want to look at the biggest ones, based on their location, so you can add filters to it. And I think once you've identified who your sort of most engaged followers are, even if it's at a small level, you know, the sort of sky's the limit in terms of what you want to do with that. Like some practical examples we've done recently that have been really, really fruitful are an artist about to launch a new video. Before we put it public on YouTube, it's unlisted. We just identify the top 100 uh, most engaged followers on, on Twitter and just send them a DM from that artist going, because he's such a massive fan, I want to give you this video before it goes live. Please share it if you like it. Like, love the artist. And the, the reception to that is just enormous. Like, you wouldn't believe the connection that people feel. And that's because you've got that one-to-one -one connection. And it, and it is so powerful. Uh, I don't think you can underestimate it. So that's something you should definitely check out. And then another one that just sort of came to mind when I was thinking about it on the way was, for the YouTube sort of element, there's something called VidIQ. And that's brilliant. It basically allows you to put a Chrome plugin onto your browser that lets you see all the metadata to any video. So you can go on any video on YouTube and see what the tags are, see what the channel tags are, see what the sort of optimization of it is. So you can look at the big videos on YouTube, look at sort of things that you aspire to, whether it be like, you know, Majestic or Suicide Sheep and see what they're doing on their videos and then sort of adopt the best practices of that. So I would look into that sort of stuff. Amazing. Um, Music press, sort of artists getting their tracks reviewed and released, or sorry, reviewed on like the likes of Mixmag and on, on uh, Resident Advisor and so on. Is it possible for these guys to get exposure without employing the services of a PR when you've no budget? How, how do you do that? How do you work your way onto those sites? Um, a big one, um, which, which we do, I work with some artists who don't have a PR, so I kind of dip into that area with them. Um, big thing is speaking to every single promoter that you are doing a show with. Um, likely they've got local pre press connections, um, so you can hit up you know, the local blog, um, the local newspaper, and really build your audience from the ground up. So speak to the promoters, because they usually have great connections. Um, and then your labels as well. You know, If you're releasing music with a label, they should be employing, usually they're employing a press team to work it. Um, you know, Make that work for you. Make sure you're speaking to that press person individually. Tell them the things that you want to be talking about. Put yourself forward for interviews um, and mixes and, and that kind of thing. I was going to touch on that. A great way to, to gain attention is to be disruptive, and that is applicable to any market you can you can name. Um, and guerrilla marketing is, is a very good tactic to utilise. So look at what everybody else is doing and try to do something in the absolute polar opposite. And we spoke about an example before we came in today of a guy called Suat, um, and he's effectively been doing Facebook live streams with minimal kit, a mobile phone, a set of decks, um, and he's been streaming live to his Facebook from really unique locations, KFC, Mac McDonald's, IKEA, and you know, in, in that approach, he's been able to go from his first ever video having 4,000 views, then to 11,000. His most recent thousand, is, his, his most recent video is broaching on 70,000 views, you know, and that's very intelligently utilizing um, the tools at hand to be disruptive and get attention. And off the back of that, you know, following, you know, going back into your question, he, people want to interview him now. They want to know, you know, where did this idea come from? Where is it developing? What's going next? So without any outside support, he's you know thought of an intelligent way to get himself noticed. So yeah, he, he can in theory. Was he no, was he a known artist before he started doing it's this? Totally unknown yeah. to anybody. And interesting, you say unknown. I, I spoke to him in depth about it, and one of the key things that has happened to him is because he's taken the music outside of the club environment, his demographic has become so broad. He can now appeal to people in their 50s and 60s because the, the CD culture of club life has disappeared. It's a McDonald's that we can all relate to. Um, and so his bandwidth to, to draw an audience in is, is exponentially grown. You know, It's not just p appealing to dance music folk, it's appealing to anybody that likes music you can tap your feet to. Um, so, so sort of very intelligent. Have you seen any examples of those kind of... Uh Guerrilla marketing tactics at Warner, is that stuff that Jews would get yeah, involved in? I mean, I, I, there's an artist we've signed recently um, called Hobo Johnson that's a kind of alternative US rapper, and 
the reason he got signed was just because he was putting up really good uh, sort of live sessions, but they were in his like backyard in Sacramento in LA that was just like a dump and like the setting of that just looked mental. So but back to that point of doing things in like unconventional places, it captures people's imagination. And if the content's good in terms of what they're actually doing and the delivery is great, then that connects with people. So I think like anything that, that breaks the mold and sort of goes against the grain, but what it is is still good quality, will find its way to the, to, to the surface. How, how can artists, uh, sort of new and emerging artists, how, they, how can they actually measure all this stuff? What are, what are, what are the, um, the outputs that they're gonna see from the different activities that, that, they're, that they're deploying in, in to further their careers? You're looking at the consumption, I suppose. Like, you know, you get, you get a real sense, you put something out and some people warm to it, you put something else out, and as long as you're seeing like a, a, a kind of upward curve of, and you feel like you're going in a direction that you want to go in, I think that's, it's very, um, anecdotal, but you do get a sense of what is connecting with people, whether it's on a small or big level. Um, and you can see that by just looking at what you're doing. It's, it should be as, as, as clear as that, really, I think. Do you think there's a, a tendency as well for, for uh, maybe expectations to be a bit, a bit too high? Yeah, I think you've got to be level-headed about things. I mean, the things that kind of transcend uh, just, you know, the normal hard work and graft of everyday, you know, music industry marketing are, are sort of once in a blue moon. They're these viral phenomenons that just catch a cultural wave. And outside of that, I think you've got to be pretty level-headed that it takes ages. You know, with artists that we develop at Warner Brothers, it can take two, three years to even get to a point where there's any real tangible interest in an artist. That's even before perhaps, you could be waiting years before you even put proper music out. And that's putting a lot of budget behind them as well. Certainly from an a and point of view. Yeah. And if you look at, I mean, most of the kind of big headline DJs um, that, that are out there today have, their history is long. Like, they have been plugging away at it. Like, just because you have one track which really connects and you get somewhere in a Beatport chart, then you need to follow it up with another track straight away and keep, you know, keep building. It's a long, it's a long slog, as you say, it could be years. To, to touch on that as an example, so Camel Fat, everybody knows the huge success that they've had. Going back to earlier on in my career, I used to work at a club that was, you know, it was horrendous ultimately, um, and they'd done a PA there, you know, a, almost like a, a PR stunt PA to try and build their profile, and they were totally unknown to everybody. Um, and now you look at them, you know, three, three, four years later, they've got this huge success. So it wasn't an overnight win, you know. 10,000 hour rule, you know, they've been putting into it, they've been utilizing these tools to get there and eventually something will will click, you know, there will be a catalyst and from there it will continue to evolve. Yeah, I think people forget that, well, or they're not aware that these, what they might consider overnight success stories have been decades, you know, in, in, the, in the planning and you see it a lot in dance music, but I think it's the, it's the, uh, the, 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 the world we live in now where everything just happens so fast, people expect immediate results, and especially in the music industry, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a roller coaster of emotions, you're being judged constantly on your, your outputs at all, at all times. Um, it, it, it's tough for, for, for kids com coming through these days, isn't it? It's as tough as it ever was. So much competition out there. Yeah, I mean, more, more choice in terms of platforms and, and sort of services, there's more to compete with. Like, you know, that's the kind of, that's the aim of the game, really. Um, do you think artists need to sort of be selective about the kind of platforms that they use and what, where, where they put themselves, invest more time into, maybe if they're an Instagram type of guy or girl, go down that route or, you know, what would you say? I mean, just from my point of view, it's, it's I find that artists really struggle to maintain, like, you know, if you think Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, like YouTube, it's pretty much impossible to cultivate all of those different environments. So I would say focus on the thing that is most natural to you, and that's where you channel your effort. Anything else outside of that is an added bonus. Otherwise, you'll kind of get into an unhappy place of trying to cultivate things that you don't want to do. But also take a look at which platforms are kind of doing well for other people too. I mean, I'm, I'm always on all my artists, Instagram. Instagram is, is the place at the moment, but you know, three years ago it was Facebook. So I think you kind of need to roll with, with how things develop. One, one interesting one, I, um, 
WhatsApp, right? You wouldn't really think of WhatsApp being like this amazing tool to grow an audience, but I've seen um, some artists actually creating literally just like WhatsApp groups and they'll add their like top 100 fans into the group and just use that as like this really personal way to start building a little movement. And some, some artists have also gone to the extent of setting up a separate phone line and then having different WhatsApp groups to just keep their like, lo so let's say you go do a, you do a show in Turkey and then you've got a little WhatsApp group where you, you know, you're speaking to your audience, your Turkish audience, and it's quite different because you wouldn't think of it in such a way, but I'm sure, you know, WhatsApp is, it could easily be used as a platform to build a, a proper fan base. Same with Messenger on Facebook, you know, the face, there's a real rise in, um, in the kind of trend of Facebook bots that some work and some just totally don't. Yeah, well, what, 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 what can you tell us about that? What are you seeing, you guys seeing? Because I, I personally always find, find them a wee bit Yeah, I, f I found you know. that when they sort of first came onto the scene and people were trying to imitate an artist, it just didn't work at all because it, you could see straight through it and it was so implausible and so tacky, it just didn't resonate. But if you're using it for a kind of informational kind of directory, like, you know, if you just people do just randomly DM artists, they're massive for some reason, I don't know why, but you know, saying, hey, so that's how you, if you have a bot set up, you then capture that kind of, that user. And if you've essentially messaged uh, an artist that has a, a sort of bot set up on their page and there's a bot installed on it, you can just use it to say, do you wanna know what my live dates are? Do you wanna see some merch? Do you wanna see my new video? And that's it, you don't have to kind of continue pushing messages down that funnel. And then it's it's almost an extension of your kind of CRM email marketing uh, sort of campaign that you've then acquired these people that are like signups that at the right time you can then message in a kind of, you know, considered measured way that isn't spammy. So it's, it is an upward trend, um, but I think you've got to be really cautious about how you use it. And I wouldn't use it until it's, you've got a bigger audience pool. Have you guys any experience in that kind of stuff, Ender? Uh, yeah, we, we set up a bot for IMS actually, which obviously it's like an event. Um, it can work quite nicely in that context because you can then give away information about the event, all the kind of stuff around there. But I've seen, um, so there's a company that we work with, um, there's a few different ones. So essentially what they've done is they work with a bunch of artists in the scene and they'd use it to basically sell the merchandise before it goes live. So typically before, they would spend thousands of pounds trying to advertise to their audience to sell their merch. And now what they've done is they've got all their fans to sign up to the bot and they'll just put out one message on the bot basically saying the merch is now live and it'll sell out in like 10 minutes. Whereas, you know, typically you'd expect you spend quite a lot of money to reach your audience. So it can work, but I think depending on the stage you are in your career, it's like, like you said, I think you have to be intelligent about where you invest your time and something like a messenger bot might not make sense if you've got 50 fans on Facebook. All right. Um Almost, uh, almost there. A couple more minutes left. Um, just, uh, can you all sort of give us an insight into some of the sort of DIY tools that, in your opinion, people in this room should all be looking at in terms of whether it's the social, whether it's it, it, it's imagery, uh, marketing, whatever. Um, the b the big one for me, um, I'm assuming pretty much all of you, if you're making music, have a Mac. You therefore got a free bit of video editing software on your Mac, <laughs> which is iMovie. Um, it's pretty clunky, it's quite basic, but it's, it does the trick. Like, I, I use it for my artists, I've created loads of videos on there. Um, that for me is like a, a simple, really simple tool, just to use something like that. For me, one of the tools um, I think people should really jump on board with is, is YouTube. And the reason I say that, it, it's, it's the long game, basically. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the, the feedback you get from those platforms is all very much instant. Um, and then it soon just dissipates. It's really weird if you get a like from something six months ago. It's a bit creepy. But YouTube, once you place content on there, it will only ever continue to grow. So if, for instance, you know, you, you've done a set and you were really impressed with a set, record it live and then maybe do a piece of camera talking about you know the specific techniques you used um, and direct people to it and, and it will only continue to grow and, and as that continues to grow so will your profile um, and you can continue to explore that so I would say you know no one's in this for the short term hopefully everyone in this room should be looking at you know longevity so start using YouTube as a platform you know I, I personally use it and I've seen huge success from it um, so I'd recommend it to, to anybody whether you're a producer DJ um, any aspect within the music industry um, so certainly the two I mentioned before uh, social rank to understand who your followers are vid IQ to understand how to better use um, YouTube for optimization and then if you you know if you're releasing music even through an independent distributor like Ditto, AWOL, or whatever, um, 
you know, your contact there should be able to get you access to things like Spotify for artists, and that's an incredibly um, intelligent platform to understand, you know, how your tracks are performing on there and, and where they're getting listened to and how. And I think that's one of the first sort of phases of understanding what consumption looks like on that. And and, and you can sort of think about, you know, independent playlist promotion and you know perhaps doing it yourself and all things like that. Really. I really like your idea about um, essentially becoming like an influencer in a sense, you know, using YouTube and some of the social platforms to talk to your audience and kind of be seen as a bit of an expert. It might not make complete sense if, depending on the type of artist you are, but if you want to be an, a professional in the music industry, I think it's like really solid as a way to go. But um, in terms of platform, I think InFlight is definitely probably one of the most smartest Thank things you. I've seen. So I'll leave that, I'll let you go into that one. Thanks, Cinder. All right, going to open up the, uh, the, the floor to questions. Anybody? Yep, at the back. Go, hang on. Um, uh, you mentioned about um, Facebook not being uh, there for a long time, might go like Instagram did, and you mentioned like um, that uh, to build your own database. What do you mean by that? Um. So there's some really nice tools out there. So I, when I said that, I was referring um, specifically to email database. Um, and there's some really nice tools out there, which I'm sure Seb's got some more than I do, but um, to where you can offer something for free in exchange for um, an email address. So a lot of artists I've worked with, even in their more developed stages, will do um, a free download for a track in exchange for data. It's really simple. Um, there's something called Unlock FM, which is a really, really cheap tool, um, which just allows you to facilitate that. I think it costs like a fiver a month, so you could just run it for one month. Um, and you can link that up to your, your MailChimp, which is a platform where you might host your database, um, which again is free if you have under 2,000 followers. Um, <coughs> but yeah, collecting email data, email addresses is, is, is a really good way to... Yeah, it's an area that we're, we've, we do a lot of work in and one of the things that I see happening a lot with new labels who come to join our service is they don't have a, an email list and they don't know who to send their promos to. So you're faced with a choice there of having a lot of budget to pay a PR company um, to promote your record or doing the hard work and building a database yourself. It takes longer but in the long run you know it, it'll pay dividends um, get, finding those fans and capturing their information and you can utilize that in so many different ways from your your promotion to your marketing and so on thank you so much um, you mentioned two apps what what were they sorry um, there were two apps that you mentioned the gentleman social rank is the one that allows you to understand who your followers are in terms of how engaged they are what, who are the smallest who are the biggest where are they based um, and vid IQ, which is V-I-D IQ, is the thing that you can install to Chrome to uh, better understand YouTube optimization of any video on YouTube, um, whether it be tags, metadata, and stuff like that. You can sort of see it really clear as day, um, and that should then inform what you do with your videos uh, in the back end on YouTube. Okay, and um, Graham has a question. One second. Hello. Uh, I, was, I was thinking in the uh, tools of the trade that not been mentioned is SoundCloud, and I kind of wondered what your thoughts of the platform are and the thoughts for the art as artists for the platform are. Obviously, uh, numbers are going down and less people are using it, but it seems to be its, its future is it, is it now gone or is it is it? It's funny. I, I actually thought of SoundCloud when we were sitting here that it didn't actually come up in conversation. It's, it's, yeah, it, no, it, not not you know, one once mentioned. Two three years ago, that that would have been there would yeah, have been two panels on SoundCloud itself. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's very telling, though, right? I, the other day, I, one of the artists who we work with, um, he had posted up a post on Facebook, and he said, "It's a real shame. Has any is anyone else experiencing this?" And he basically put images of um, his tracks when he uploads it onto Facebook and SoundCloud, and Facebook, he had like 500 likes on it. Same track on SoundCloud had like 15 listens. Yeah, I saw that as well. Dex Kane. Yeah. yeah, and like, you know, I think loads of people are experiencing it, so that's probably why it's not even been mentioned, but I don't know, from your perspective, it's, you know, as a discovery platform, it's definitely there, but it seems like maybe the, the, the way the algorithms are working on Facebook are not mm. allowing these other linked sites to really mm. sort of get their coverage that they would normally get. For sure. Yeah. I, th I think on that note, SoundCloud is great, but it's limited in terms of the narrative it can pass across, whereas Facebook, 
delivers a very good narrative and people love stories. Um, so Facebook, it becomes almost like a, a, a more uh, preferred platform to use because SoundCloud is just a song. I'm not saying take it away. There's definitely still place there, but there is more strength in, in being able to tell a story through platforms such as Instagram and, and Facebook as such and people buy into it more as a, as a whole. Okay, any more? Yeah, um, what about uh, like the original web page? Not social media, but just to use your own web page for the yeah, race. So th this is something I, I work a lot with artists um, in terms of like when we're building an EPK as such. And, and I, I recommend every single one of you to have your own website page. They're very cheap to run and very cheap to, to, to set up. Alongside that, have your own domain with your own email address um, just to keep things very professional. The, the problem with the site is diverting traffic there. If you don't have a huge traffic, it's very difficult to funnel it to that. Um, but it does look professional if, for instance, you then present it to a promoter. Um, so I would say utilize other social media platforms in terms of building the, the following and the interest, um, but have the um, have the website almost as like a digital CV, basically. So you're, you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's in terms of professionalism in the industry. Yeah, exa exactly that as well, from our point of view. Uh, on any kind of emerging artists, we just tend to have a splash page type setup, which is just more of a directory to point people in different directions to social media listening uh, sort of platforms or like live dates. So nothing too expansive, but it's good to have. Any more questions, guys? Yeah, sorry. Hi, um, what are some challenges you might face when taking a smaller brand of an artist which may be genuine and just keeping that authenticity while this artist grows. And may this authenticity come to an expense of maybe profit at the end of the day, so having to turn down certain deals just to maintain that authenticity. I mean, I think from our point of view, uh, we, you know, it's very common to see artists and managers and record labels turning down particular, you know, brand deals, especially if they don't fit with the narrative and, and the authenticity of that, that you know, craft at, at any given time. Um, so I think it's super important to hold that integrity, um, especially as an emerging artist gets bigger and there's more cooks in the kitchen, so to say, there's more opinions, more different things pulling in different directions. Um, the more that, you know, you can have uh, a sort of really divisive view on what that narrative is, the better. I think uh, an interesting one is, uh, mainly specifically to brand partnerships, is it does kind of, I think it makes sense to think about, like, what would your vision be if there were some projects that you really wanted to launch, but you need the funding from a brand? It makes sense to have those as your thought process. So if you ever do get approached by a brand or you get into those conversations, you can go to them with ideas rather than them dictating what they think you should do. And we've done it a lot. There's a few artists that we're working with now. Like, one of them, he's going to an the Antarctic and... He's literally said, this is what I'm going to do, and I just need a brand to pay for it. And he's a global artist like with millions of fans, and it's really easy to get that across because he loves the project, and it's now just about finding the right brand that can plug into it. So I think it makes sense, you know, have your vision about what would you want to do with a brand, then you can sort of work it out that way. 